Shall I stand up or sit down? Whatever you want. However you like. Okay, guys. Sorry for the extreme delay, but So, um, <coughs> hold on. Water. So, um, thank you, Sue, for um, allowing me to give this lecture. Um, I hope everyone finds it interesting. Um, so, let me first introduce myself. Um, I'm Sami, I'm an historian, and I completed my PhD here at Manchester in 2018. Uh, my thesis dealt with Manchester and the British West Indies from 1700 until 1838. Um, I'm currently a TA here at Manchester for this semester in the History Department. I'm also a TA at MMU, where I teach early American history, and here I teach capitalism and historical perspectives. Um, I also work for my dad's family business, selling doors, reclaimed bricks and tiles, so if anyone wants to buy any of that stuff, I'm your guy. <laughs> so, uh, if I get a bit ranty, um, I apologise about that. Um, my mum says I rant too much, but then she gets daily mail delivered to her house. So, like, I don't trust her judgement at all. <laughs> So today, I'll be talking about capitalism, slavery, and their relevance to 21st century Manchester. Um, I had problems deciding on this title. Um, should it have been capitalism's past and slavery's past, or capitalism's present? I'm terrible with snazzy titles, um, unlike a lot of other academics. Um, just ask my former supervisor or editors of any articles that I've submitted. But hopefully, my approach will make thematic sense by the end of this lecture. Just a quick note, there may be some ideas, concepts and descriptions of violence and the like which are offensive. So please be aware of this. So I'm not used to lecturing about the present, um, let alone the future. But forgive me, I am an historian after all. So I'll start by talking about the past. I think it's important as a starting point to think about Eric Williams' seminal publication Capitalism and Slavery. So Eric Williams was the first historian to explicitly connect notions of capitalism and the plantation economy and slavery. It was published in 1944 and is based on his thesis, which he completed in Oxford in 18, 1938. So uh, that's Eric Williams there, and um, that's me with Eric, Eric Williams Connell, who is Eric Williams' daughter. Um, that was at a conference recently. And that's the book itself, Capitalism and Slavery. So Williams himself was from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, he was only a lecturer in Britain for two years of his life. Just two years. Um, he was loathed by his colleagues and despised by the academic establishment. Now there's something that's been puzzling me for years as to why he was so hated. Hmm. Was it because he had bad breath? Was it because he walked around campus naked. No, no, it wasn't. I'll hazard a guess as to the reason why he was so hated in Britain in the 1930s and 1940s. Yes, he was a black academic in Britain. So owing to the racially charged atmosphere, Williams migrated to the United States in 1939. He taught politics and West Indian history at Howard University, an historically black university in Washington. So his book challenged Reginald Copeland's work which posited the theory that the British Empire was a force for good, that helped to civilise and bestow humanitarian systems of government and benevolent ideas that benefited those who existed under colonial rule. Anyway, Frank, Hitt Frank Pittman, another historian who is at Yale, apparently thought that the book was a sound piece of work. I suggested that in a few places he softened his somewhat caustic racial bias against capitalism, which I detected. I told him to let the facts alone constitute, in the main, the judgment against capitalist malpractices. So a caustic racial bias against capitalism. So apologies, but what in a shit does that mean? And well, why would capitalism care? Did capitalism care about racial bias in the 18th, 19th centuries? What about in 1944 when this book was published? How about even today? Capitalism creates and weaponizes racial bias. It goes hand in hand, hand, hand in glove with racism, just as it uses sexism, homophobia, disablism, ageism, 
all the oppressive isms and built-in responses of a neoliberal society that considers certain, certain, subgroup, certain groups inferior. Capitalism used slavery, whether it was profitable or not, and slavery used capitalism, which was always profitable. In the 20th century, 21st century, capitalism uses exploited labour, which is always profitable, to produce iPhones in China, Primark t-shirts in the Dominican Republic, and Nike trainers in Vietnam, all available in Manchester. Slavery, thus, needs to fulfil a, a, a double function. In line, in line with Marx's sense, slavery is a first for, is a historical form of labour exploitation. That is, one should be careful to, to distinguish the coercively totalising and holistically dehumanising nature of fully fledged and racialised slavery that is particular, particularly characterised 400 years of the African slave trade from the various qualified forms of slavery that pertain of under capitalist modes of production, or what other people call waste slavery and that kind of thing. I don't kind of use those terms though. So capitalism's uneven, uneven development in historical practice has meant many members of the world's population have only recently, or have only just now, entered into waged work associated with early phases of industrial stage market of market capitalism. Mod uh, uh, models of developments unleashing, unleashing of a transnational capitalist logic has the Im imperative of capitalist industrialization spread and intensified across all the unevenly developed countries of the entire planet. Sorry. One effect of this unleashing and assuming all the advent of global technologies has been the globalization of the circuits of capitalist accumulation across labouring populations and forms of the capitalist labour process located in nation states that are at very different stages of industrial development. So, back to Williams. Williams himself considered was cons considered himself to be an academic, even after he left, formally left academia. He was president, he was prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago for, for 20 years. Um, yeah, Trent, that wasn't a good thing. So, uh, but he was a very complex person anyway. So he explained, to, he explained the rise of the Atlantic slave system, um, with ex, uh, which fitted with extraordinary precision into the world market forces of the modern era. And he was the first historian to recognize Manchester's place in the capitalist world of the plantation economy and Atlantic slave trade networks. Manchester, through its planters, traders, merchants, and even abolitionists, were intimately connected to the intricacies of the slave trade and slavery. Not until the end of the 18th century did Mancunians seem to have a more attuned, seem to be more attuned to market incentives, to the possibilities of maximising labour discipline and proprietary rights, or to opening or to the opening of for vast networks of trade, of credit and production. This was the great awakening of capitalism. Williams simply proposed to carry this forward the same process to explain slavery's demise, with an analogous compound of economic forces and political economy that an industrial capitalism turned around destroy and destroyed the power of mercantilism, the plantation economy, slavery, and all of its works. So also, it's important to comprehend the very meaning of capitalism and slavery itself along with their disaggregated component parts. Do our very thoughts about slavery and capitalism solely model the underlying realities behind them, substituting, substituting an abstract set of intellectually imposed paradigms to construct two discrete categories where none might actually exist? So let's first consider King Street, Manchester. So in 2020, it is considered Manchester's most upmarket shopping area. Its history dates back to 1708, to a 1708 Act of Parliament, which saw the building of the nearby St Anne's Church. The church was given a space of 30 yards wide for a fair, and this became St Anne's Square. A well-to-do area away from the rough and ready market, near what, near what is now Exchange Square, which would grow in importance throughout the 18th century and become the official centre of the city. As a result, the city beside it also prospered. Especially those on the south, the principle of which was, it was the directly adjacent King Street. So this is King Street in the 18th century. 
In the 18th century, the prosperous and profit-making cotton industries and manufacturers lived on the street. William Davenport, for example, purchased most of his cotton from a merchant on the street between 1748 and 1776. 48% of all slaves purchased in Old Calabar, which is now part of Nigeria, were exchanged for Manchester cotton that Davenport himself had, had obtained just from one merchant living, living at 17 King Street. So cotton goods consist in Manchester consisted of fustians, a mixture of cotton and linen, and were often referred to as Manchester goods in the account books of merchants from Boston to Barbados. As Eric Williams stated, from the year 1700 onwards, during the entire period, slavery and cotton marched together. So at number 17 King Street now is a fashion chain store called White Stuff. <laughs> So as a pathway of capitalist development, which was supposedly good at its chosen task for 300 years, reached a hard limit. Is capitalist development just a circle where you basically end up at the metaphorical place you were, the metaphorical place you were 300 years ago? Or is always a hard limit the current climate crisis? Not to pick on this one shop, but I think it serves a point. One t-shirt can, take, can take, to take up to 2,700 litres of water to make. Enough for one person to drink for two and a half years. And it, if, if it isn't farmed organically, a third, of, the, a third <coughs> of a pound of pesticides and other agricultural chemicals, t-shirts, uh, uh, particularly those with heathered, heathered, with, uh, with heathered yarns of mixed colours, may contain polyester and other synthetic fibres, which is derived from crude oil and emit greenhouse gas emissions from extraction to disposal. They were also linked to the production of microplastics, minuscule fragments of plastic, tinier than one fifth of an inch, that slough off during laundering to pollute the oceans, oceans tap water, sea salt, and, gut, and the guts of sea life around the world. So as Gurminder Bamba has posited, if we are interested in the questions of inequality in the present, we have to think about how inequalities are constituted by historical processes, nationally and internationally. So abolitionism was the first form of activism that spread throughout Manchester in the late 18th century. It challenged slavery's influence and grew concomitantly with the development of capitalism during the same era. You can draw a, draw a straight line from abolitionism through to modern day activism. Indeed, Naomi Klein in This Changes Everything, Capitalism versus the Climate, argues in the starkest terms imaginable that that our culture is at a tipping point. So slavery wasn't a crisis for the British and American elites until abolitionism turned it into one. Racial discrimination wasn't a crisis until the civil rights turned it into one. Sex discrimination wasn't a crisis until feminism turned it into one. Apartheid wasn't a crisis until the anti-apartheid turned it into one. So the climate crisis is exemplified by Hurricane Dorian in September 2019 which flattened Abaco Island and displaced thousands of people in the, Bar in Bar in the Bahamas. It forced us to reconsider Britain's humanitarianism, humanitarian and anti-historical responsibilities throughout the Caribbean. The tragic irony is that Abaco Island was considered one of the most profitable islands in the Bahamas after the influx of between 5,000 to 7,000 American loyalists to Britain during the American Revolution and also their slaves. Sea Island cotton was, the first sown, was first sown by these settlers in 1785. So why isn't Empire 2.0 as interested in the economic fortunes of the Bahamas in 20, 20, 20, 2019 or 2020 as Empire 1.0 was in 1785? So, Um, in the March 11th, 1826 edition of the Manchester Courier, the editor proclaims that we are very happy to have it in our power to announce a sensible improvement in the state of trade in this town. And a pretty fair sprinkling of business has been done. The article then mentions that the Chamber of Commerce, which was comprised of seven gentlemen of high respectability, and the chairman of the board is Samuel Hibbert Esquire. This section of the newspaper highlights the economic 
and political primacy that the plantation-owning plantation Hibbert family occupied in early 19th century Manchester. Liverpool cotton market prices are also included in a separate, cotton, in a separate column. While on the same page, the, report, the uh, reportage includes a section which states, it has been generally rumoured, we, we know not upon what authority, that ministers were generally anxious that anti-slavery petitions should be poured in from all parts of the kingdom at this present juncture, in order that, in order that they may be thus pre presented with a plausible pretext for following up their conciliatory suggestions to the West Indian colonists. A single page of a local newspaper, wittingly or not, encapsulates the intersection of issues such as capitalism and slavery that residents of Cottonopolis, Manchester, had laid the foundations of, helped to sustain and then challenged. This iterates the role that Manchester played in the maintenance of colonial trade, which expanded rapidly during this era in which the Hibberts were on the rise. The Hibberts also built the West India Docks in London. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. So undeniably, <coughs> excuse me, undeniably, these notions percolate through history from the 18th century until today. So fundamentally, Manchester's involvement in the triangular trade and the plantation economy depended upon the transit of exploited Africans across the Atlantic Ocean. The economic, political and maritime power of the British Empire also enabled its subjects, Mancunians, Mancunian planters, merchants and traders, to extend their exploitative influence and accumu accumulation of capital beyond the boundaries of Manchester, Cottonopolis. At a basic level, because capitalism began in Britain, which is an old-fashioned and contentious view, I know, with the convergence of agricultural improvements, global explorations and scientific advances, means that capitalism projected around the globe in the 18th and 19th centuries. This makes us understand the notion of ca that capitalism was a historical development was a historical development and not a discovery of universal principles. Similarly, racism, xenophobia, imperialism, populism and nationalism are historical, value, are historical developments and not universal principles. Without capitalism, would these ideas exist? Yet the people of Africa had capitalism thrust upon them by, as, by Britons, um, arriving to exploit their resources or to kidnap them, kidnap them to the Americas. These subjects of the British Empire were hierarchically ordered on, his, on racial grounds. This categorization of racialized subjects extended not only to Manchester, the British West Indies and Africa in centuries past, but also to Brexit, the Windrush scandal, the Roads Must Fall movement and the ongoing problems of representation and engagement that minorities face in all strata of ac British academia and society more broadly. So the final decades of the 18th century witnessed changes that signalled the arrival of activism as a historical force, namely abolitionism. Activism and representations of the vox populi were disregarded routinely by politicians, unlike today of course. With Rome writing in 1783 that if a minister shall attempt to govern by the opinion of the public, this country will soon be found in a state of anarchy and confusion. So the post-2016 irony isn't lost on me. Nonetheless, it, is, it was the mobilisation of public opinion by abolitionists which ushered in the, real, the realisation that this was a new period of attitudes towards slavery. Not in the sense of inaugurating an era of uninterrupted victories, but in the sense that the terms of public discourse about the institution in Britain was dramatically and forever altered. So even so, anti-slavery itself attracted causes, classes of people throughout Manchester, beyond the small circle of propagandists and elite politicians, which historians and popular culture tend to lionise. So who's heard of William, Ab William Wilberforce, MP, right? So everyone's heard of Wilberforce. Well, what about Peter Kerr, a warehouseman who lived on 10 Bloom Street in Salford? How about Thomas Priestnell, a cotton printer who was located, who business was located at number 73 Port Street in Manchester? So much historical work has focused on a downward flow model. 
focusing on the influence of great men of history, of abolition as well, and their influence upon the popular anti-slavery movement. So these two men, along with thousands of other, others lost history, signed an abolitionist petition in 1806. So uh, the names in blue are the ones who signed the abolitionist petition, the ones in red signed the pro-slavery petition. So these, pe these people were cogs in the wheels of capitalism, yet they chose to challenge an exploitative system which underpinned it. And, and they no doubt, however peripherally, peripherally, simultaneously profited from it. Petitions were a physical microcosm of the increasing separation between the elite and the burgeoning power of the British working class and the middle class. Manchester was the first city to, in Britain to produce an abolitionist petition in 1788. The first Manchester petition also coincided with the release of two, of two notable slave narratives, one by Altabar Kirk Kirk Buano in 1787 and one by Aluda Equiano in 1789. Soon after, Equiano sailed to Britain to promote his book. After he stopped on his tour, Equiano rec uh, recreated the interesting narrative subscription index by publishing the name of, names of his supporters in local newspapers. So here, for example, is one note of gratitude he wrote to the editors of, the 17, of a 1790 issue of the Manchester Mercury, which was printed on the front page just below the ba banner. Sir, I beg you to suffer me publicly, suffer me thus publicly to, expa to express my, my grateful acknowledgement to them for their favours and for their fellow feeling that they have discovered for my very poor and much pressed countrymen. These act acts of commiseration have filled my heart with gratitude. Therefore, permit me, sir, on my behalf and on behalf of the rest of my brethren to offer my sincere thanks for the testimony of your regard to the disabled people. Well, anti-slavery activity transcended class boundaries insofar as much effort, as insofar as such efforts had an egalitarian and inclusive methodology, which often helped to engender, gender, engender general public sympathy. The egalitarian nature of abolitionism in Manchester is shown by the fact that the Manchester proletariat, including cotton spinners, cotton spinners and factory workers, concurred on this issue with mercantilist, artisanal, entrepreneurial and capitalist bourgeoisie of the city. Slavery was a cause which would anti-slavery anti was a cause which could elevate its citizens above the prosaic level of their daily working life. This is shown in this map. So post-signatory post-slavery signatories are in blue, while abolitionists are in red. So here again is King Street. The, uh, the reason why neighbours, business rivals and fair friends would be on opposite sides of the slavery debate are complex. But capitalism highlights these seeming paradoxes. Another aspect of regional, regional anti-slavery was the role of women. Female abolitionists were often deeply involved with the cause. They were forbidden from signing or even touching a petition. It would have been forbidden, for, uh, it would have been considered improper for, for respectable women to associate directly with an abolitionist petition. It was also deemed improper for women to be tainted by the corrupting influence of the marketplace and the exchange of goods and capital, which capitalism and slavery itself would consist of. So the chains that, ba the chains that bound Manchester to the British West Indies continue until this day. In February 2019, the Manchester Evening News reported that a popular DJ, rapper and youth worker Owen Haisley, 45, who emigrated from Jamaica to Manchester, aged just four, was facing deportation for 2015 domestic assault conviction. Haisley told the newspaper that, I know I did wrong with my domestic incident, but I am not a repeat offender. I've gone to prison, done my sentence, done the rehabilitation, I'm not going to reoffend. And that he feels more Mancunian than Jamaican. Yet one response Yet one response to this localised exa example of the Windrush scandal was for Owen's friends to start a petition in favour of him being allowed to remain in the country. He has lived most of his life in this country. So last time I checked, the number of signatories amounted to 111,126 and his case has been raised in Parliament. While Owen's deportation to Jamaica 
was halted on February the 5th, 2019. His case is still ongoing. And he's been disbarred from gaining seekful employment, benefits, or even access to the NHS services. The overwhelming public response to this case and the power of petitioning, despite the differences in technological conveyance, underscores the relevance of, of issues such, such as race, empire, post-colonialism, and the power of mass mobilization and popular movements outside of formal democratic institutions, such as parliament. Exploitation and oppression knows no temporal boundaries. So in contemporary Western thought, which we take, more, we take for more or less for granted the, that things, physical objects and rise to them represent the, the natural universe of commodities. Uh, um, at the opposite pole, we place people who represent the, nat the natural universe of individualization and singularization. This conceptual polarity of individualized persons and commoditized things is recent and culturally speaking exceptional. People have been commoditized again and again throughout British history by the institutions of capitalism and slavery. Violence, whether physical, economic, rhetorical or cultural, develops together and perpetually reinforces itself. The, sla the slave ship and the plantation embodied brutal logic and calm mentality of capitalism in the 18th and 19th century, while the holding facilities and the hostile environment and other representations of the virulently racist bastions of Toryism represented in the 21st century. So a horrifying example of this contemporary commodification of human beings is that many victims of the Windrush scandal are detained in Manchester in a place is what is no, which is known as a residential short-term holding facility called Pennine House in Terminal 2 at Manchester Airport. So this is it here. This airport is run by an outsourcing giant called uh, Mitty, which has been described as the UK's biggest migrant detention profiteer. So like many of the outsourcing giants, it has been a tough time financially, which I know, I know, I feel so sorry for them. So sorry for them. My sympathies. So it has been issuing a, a string of profit warnings and declaring losses over the last two years. Yet, it works in immigration control, and it, yet its work in immigration control has always been profitable. With profits from the government, from government contracts, predicted to be above 20% or more. Capitalism still dictates that black bodies are a viable source of profit in 2020, as they were in 1720. So these interactions at these holding facilities in Manchester are th and throughout Britain are often violent, degrading and barbarously out of sight, out of mind. Capitalism and violence are contiguous. So a few miles away from here is Quarry Bank Mill. I don't know if anyone's heard of it, Quarry Bank Mill. So a national trust property. It is one of the best known, best preserved textile mills of the Industrial Revolution and is now a museum of the cotton industry. Um, I was a researcher in residence there for one year. It was built in 1784 by Samuel Gregg and inspired the 2013 Channel 4 TV show, The Mill. So Quiet Bank Mill was notable for his innovative approach to labour relations, largely because of the works of Gregg's wife, Hannah Lightbody, Hannah Gregg. The mill is often used as a case study in history and other subjects, as a uh, case study of family capitalism for educational purposes and it's used in schools as well. The mill is, uh, it utilised child apprentices, a system that continued until, 17, until 1847. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, um, um, yeah. Uh, the first child apprentices lived in lodgings in the neighbourhood. Then, in 1790, Greg built at the apprentice house near the factory. Greg believed that he could get the best out of his workers by treating their family, them fairly. He hired a superintendent to attend to their cares and morals, and members of the Gregg family themselves and external tutors gave them lessons. It was a decent standard of living. So this is in stark contrast to the treatment of the Greggs, of Gregg slaves, on this plantation which is called Hillsborough. That's the map of Hillsborough in Dominica, where the manager of the estate wrote in his diary about one slave, 
One of the runaways from Hillsborough voluntarily returned to the estate. He was condemned to be hanged, his head, shook on a, his head stuck on a pole in the marketplace in Russo, and his body hung in chains on the most conspicuous part of the plantation to which he belonged. So violence permeates Manchester's history. One historian, who shall remain nameless, recently wrote a book on Peterloo regarding the anniversary of, Peter, of the Peterloo Massacre. About 200 years ago, is it, it's still possible to be angry about Peterloo. I ask you then, what feelings should be left felt regarding the nameless and forgotten victims of racial violence and genocidal repression that occurred in Manchester Parish, Jamaica, rather than Manchester, Britain? Great Britain in the years before, in, the, uh, in Great Britain, before and after the year 1819, which is when Peterloo took place. 300 freedom fighters, for example, died in Booster's, Booster's Rebellion, which took place just three years prior to the, Peter, uh, to the uh, massacre at Peterloo, where 15 people were killed at Peterloo. So, um, <coughs> The slave ship commodified labour, which the theories and institutions of capitalism would take for granted, and Marx would criticise, while Max Weber enables us, or enables us to see the ethos and logic that preceded and make possible such commodification. No one today is alive, and no one alive today is responsible for, uh, for slavery, a crime against humanity. What we all need to face our histories and to try to move forward from that acknowledgement of the past and deal with capitalism's future, if it has one. The ongoing controversy of decolonizing curriculums and the lack of diversity in all employment sectors, including academia, throughout Britain, all relate to a memory void regarding the treatment of slaves in the imperial past and how this influences the treatment of their descendants and other minorities in 2020. So the influx of capital into Manchester led to more Sunday schools, more social clubs, the Manchester Literary and Philosophical Club and the Portico Library, for example. Slavery helps to connect Mancunians, helped to connect Mancunians to the outside world. In a way, it intellectualised its population. Owens College, later to become University of Manchester, was founded with the support of Oliver Haywood, who himself was an abolitionist. Yet his father, Benjamin, financed over 100 voyages to the British West Indies and Africa, which carried over 37,000 slaves to the British West Indies, while also owning several banks, with one prominently built on Exchange Street in Manchester in 1788. The same year of the first Manchester abolitionist petitions. So there's capitalism and coincidences. So the controversial and paradoxical legacy of the Hayward, for example, complicates our understanding of what a university is and what its connection to capitalism means today and in its future. So Glasgow University recently agreed to pay £20 million in reparations to atone for its historical links to the transatlantic slave trade um, in what the University of the West Indies has described as a bold historic move. So um, Dame Nancy, if she's listening, unlikely. So the question of reparations, therefore, for instance, must come up every few years as something that the media superficially engaged with and then there's predictable backlash. So the intellectualization of the uh, and education of the city's populace and the invigoration of Manchester's abolitionism in the 1780s led to a reactionary reinvigoration re led to a reactionary re reinforcement of a justificatory ideology that black people need to be saved from heathenism and ignorance. So the univers universality of ideas of freedom, which became rooted in abolitionism, were challenged by pseudo-scientific ra racism popularised by writers such as David Hume and Montesquieu. So these ideas pervaded groups closely uh, Groups pervaded groups closely, which, uh, which are within the vicinity of anti slavery agitators. Uh, the Manchester Literary and Philosophical Society, which included countless abolitionists as members, hosted Charles White. This is Charles White. 
um, a local, he was a local physician who gave a lengthy speech on the alleged inferiority of blacks, in which he ranted that in whatever respect the African differs from the European, the particularity brings him nearer to the ape. This lecture, subsequently published in 1799, became a notable reference point for British racism for over 100 years, and the scientific racism followed, and the scientific racism that followed, and yet he has a blue plaque in his memory in Manchester. So, to conclude, the future of capitalism is inextricably linked to its slave-based past. The notion of, capitalist, of a capitalist society and a capitalist university is something that not just academics, but the wider public more generally must grapple with. Universities are just one microcosmic example of this. The capitalist university is compelled to show its worth in the form of commercialised technology, general economic impact, market-led research, the economic mobility of its graduates, of, or human capital formation measured by salary increments. Universities do, do have other valued intellectual and social outcomes, but capitalism relegates them to, sec to a secondary status. Cats, capitalism must, must destroy to advance. It decolonizes the co curriculum enough, though. The petitions, activism and culture wars over Brexit, the Windrush scandal and controversial legacies of empire, including capitalism and reparations, are influenced by our collective memory of slavery and the plantation economy and the nation tradition of humanitarian in interventionism. So in conclusion, and in conclusion of his book, Williams writes that, we find the, we find the British statesman defending slavery today, abusing slavery tomorrow defending slavery the day after. Today, they are imperialist. The next day, anti-imperialist. And equally pro-imperialist a generation after. The thing defended or attacked is always something you can touch and see. To be measured in pounds sterling or in dollars and cents. This is not a crime, this is a fact. It is understandable at, at, at the time, but historians writing 100 years after have no excuse for continue, continuing to wrap the real interests in confusion. Of these deplorable tendencies, Professor Coupland, who I mentioned earlier in the lecture, was a notable example. So who will be notable examples defending capitalism, its legacies and its future in 100 years, in 2020? Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>